<clears throat> so I want to take today as an opportunity to sketch broadly the long 19th century's efforts to account for the geological and biological origins of atolls. Simply, an atoll is a ring-like coral island that nearly or entirely closes a lagoon. An atoll traces the perimeter of what was once the coastline of a volcanic island. It may take 10,000 years for a coral reef to completely encircle an island, and over millions of years as the reef continues to build up for the island to erode and sink. And it is at this point that the reef is considered an atoll. The 19th century's intellectual history of coral reefs. Oh, sorry, before I do that, I just want to show you a few slides that sort of give you a, a visualization of what an atoll is and how we get to it, since I'm aware that um, uh, maybe uh, numerous uh, people watching are maybe not entirely familiar. So um, on the left hand side, uh, we have a volcanic island. And once it becomes extinct, uh, the island uh, begins to sink as the ocean floor subsides. The coral reef um, builds a fringing reef and it continues to grow upwards and away from the island. Subsi subsidence continues and the fringing reef becomes a larger barrier reef and it is now moving farther away from the coastline of the island that is uh, moving downwards, the lagoon uh, is beginning to expand, and then ultimately the island has, um, the volcanic island has become uh, an entirely submarine mount below the sea, and the barrier reef um, is now what we would call an atoll, sometimes uh, referred to as a coral island or a lagoon island. Uh, next slide, and now I'm going to just show you a few uh, pictures uh, that were produced by, by NASA that sort of demonstrate the, the evolution um, of an island. Um, these were all taken uh, from space. This is an image of uh, Pitcairn Island in uh, Eastern Oceania. So as we can see that this is a uh, volcanic um, island and you can see the difference in the blue around the coastline of the island, um, which indicates uh, the presence of reef page. So this would be our stage of departure. This is not Pitcairn Island. Um, this is Oeno. Um, and as you can see in the center, uh, the, the volcanic island that was once there has subsided a great deal, but you can still see a um, significant amount of landmass. Um, what the light blue, that is the, the lagoon. Um, and then around the lagoon, uh, you see a, a lighter color of brown and white. And that is the coral reef that is encircling the lagoon. Next slide. And then uh, eventually, um, this is a, a fully formed, um, a fully formed atoll. Um, in which the volcanic island has com completely subsided um, beneath the, the sea's surface. And uh, we can see very distinctly the different islets um, or motu that make up uh, the atoll. So the, the atoll, the, the coral reef, is not one single reef. Um, it can be extensive portions of reef, but um, also made up of islets that are separated uh, by seawater. Okay. So the 19th century's intellectual history of coral reefs and atolls echoes, unsurprisingly, many of the century's enduring questions regarding the depth of the ocean, submarine volcanism, and the dynamism of the Earth's crust. Such concerns were the impetus for the establishment of the Royal Society's Coral Reef Committee in 1895. One of the committee's founders, the geologist T.G. Bonney, stressed the need for a field study, lest the origin and history of a coral reef remain undetermined. Deep drilling, or boring, on an atoll surface at a depth of at least 600 feet was deemed as a requirement to confirm the composition of the atoll's foundation. 
Captain Wharton, a hydrographer for the British Admiralty, suggested the atoll of Funafuti in the British protectorate of the Ellis Islands, what is today the nation of Tuvalu, with Sydney as the Australian base of operations. The Royal Society's Funafuti expedition benefited from a loan by the colony of New South Wales Department of Mines, a drill that incorporated a hollow cylindrical diamond tipped bit which could extract a continuous core of rock as the hole was bored. Between 1896 and 1898, dozens of British and Australian scientists descended upon Funafuti armed with a plethora of drilling and dredging machinery, diamond drills, wheeled vehicles, and a sand and water pump in all over 200 packages of gear with over 1400 feet of boring rods and over 2000 feet of lining pipes. Despite a great deal of effort and financial backing, the results of the investigation by means of a boring to ascertain the depth and structure of a coral reef remained inconclusive and remained and continued to be inconclusive until roughly 1947 with the US Navy backed scientific drilling of Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands of the Western Pacific. The broader context for the drilling um, of Bikini was to assess the effects of Operation Crossroads, the atomic bomb tests that had occurred the previous year. The Royal, no, say, yeah, <laughs> the Royal Society's final report entitled uh, the Atoll of Funafuti, Borings into a Coral Reef and the Results, published in 1904, and this is the cover page, provides us with the first thorough geological description and interpretation of any atoll structure. Um, and currently, I'm specifically interested in section uh, five of the report entitled The Geology of Funafuti, written by two geologists, Edgeworth David and George Sweet. David and Sweet's text is accompanied by 14 large scale map sheets. Uh, and they are included in a separate portfolio from this report that include a total of 91 geological cross sections with explanatory notes. These maps, and I'll be showing you um, a couple of them towards the end of the presentation. These maps were the result of David and Sweet's surface geological investigations of the 30 islets that make up Funafuti's rim. Um, I want to suggest today that these maps and their descriptions foreground an abiding vision of atolls as narrow strips of land bounded by an expanse of water, a microcosmic fieldwork laboratory of sorts, rather than conceiving of the atoll as a state of tension between closure and openness. In the following section, I want to provide a brief summary of the scientific debates about the formation of atolls during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, which led up to the Royal Society's drilling expedition on Funafuti. Uh, next. These debates, which were later referred to in the early 20th century as the coral reef problem, revolved around three main questions. What was the composition of atolls? So what were atolls made of? What was the cause of their distinctly annular shape? Uh, atolls tend to be circular, cylindrical, kind of round-ish formation. And what accounted for their patterns of distribution, i.e. why did atolls repeatedly appear in long chains or in clusters? What was the reason for that? Thanks. The German naturalist Johann Reinhold Forster, who accompanied Cook on HMS Endeavour, was probably the first European naturalist to speculate on the origin of atolls. In observations made during a voyage around the world published in 1778, Forster offers, quote, a few observations which may serve to establish a theory for the formation of the tropical isles in the South Sea. Low isles, low isles refers to atolls, connected by reefs and coral rocks are produced, according to Forster, by polyp-like animals who want to shelter their habitation from the impetuosity of the winds and the power and rage of the ocean. 
Forster then claims that Atoll's striking shape is due to the instinct of the polyps who construct only narrow ledges of coral rocks to secure in their middle a calm and sheltered place. Thus Forster's innovation was to suggest that rather than merely inhabiting reef and other shallow areas, corals had created the entire structure of atolls in order to protect themselves from the power and the rage of the ocean, as he put it. Earlier in his observations, he remarks that the ocean surrounding atolls is, quote, almost unfathomable, implying that the submarine structures underlying atolls must be enormous coral structures. We skip ahead a couple of decades after the Napoleonic Wars to 1821, when the naturalist aboard the Russian vessel Rurik, Adalbert von Camiso, also addressed what he called the peculiar formation of low islands. For Camiso, their shape is due to the fact that atolls are what he called table mountains, which rise perpendicularly from the depths of the ocean. The surface of the table is below water. Only a broad dam round the circumference, the reef, reaches the surface at low water. Camiso apparently believed that the atoll's submarine structure, that is the, what he calls the table, was composed of a different material from the dam. He says, the dam consists of horizontal layers of a limestone. Quote, while the foundation could be inferred from the masses of rock thrown upon the dam, which often contains only larger fragments of madrepores than the layers exposed to view above. Quote. Like Forster, Camiso recognized that coral polyps were responsible for building atolls. And again, like Forster, the nature of the ocean's depth remained highly speculative. Quote, we cannot but believe that in those parts of the sea where the enormous masses of this formation rise, even in the cold, unillumined bottom of the ocean, animals are continually employed in producing by the process of their life the material for its indisputably continued growth and increase. End quote. The mystery of what an atoll's foundation consisted of was partially solved by two French naturalists at around the same time as Camiso was uh, voyaging and writing, who sailed aboard the vessel uh, called Lurani. The two naturalists were Jean-René Coy and Joseph Paul Guémard. In an 1825 article, they set out to correct the commonly accepted opinions about atolls, namely that atolls do not consist entirely of coral rock, and that corals do not rise like perpendicular walls from the depth of the ocean as Camiso had imagined. Right? So both Forster and Camiso are imagining that coral polyps uh, exist at the bottom of the ocean and grow upwards towards the surface. The two French naturalists argue against this. The principal reason uh, for their argument against this in direct opposition uh, with received opinion at this time, is that hard corals, stony corals, cannot grow in deep water. Unlike Camiso's belief that polyps thrived in cold, unillumined bottoms of the ocean, Coy and Guémard argued that hard corals require um, the influence of light, that they require sunlight in order to grow. And so it is highly unlikely that they would enjoy living um, at the bottom of the ocean, where there is very little light. For Coy and Guémard, therefore, the foundation of atolls consisted or must have consisted of the same elements and minerals that make up islands and known continents. The realization that reef building, stony coral, could only grow in warm, shallow water had significant implications on the debates about atoll formation. How could reefs grow from unfathomable depths and yet be made by shallow water organisms? The answer was literally provided by Coy and Guimard in a footnote. Perhaps the coral polyps grew atop submarine craters, 
as they put it. The hypothesis that atolls sat atop submarine mounts that heave upwards soon became the dominant one. The question of how these submarine mounts could rise up was taken up by one of the most influential 19th century geologists, Charles Lyell, who addressed atoll formation in his three volume, Principles of Geology, published between 1830 and 1833. Lyell's interest in atolls lay in their relation to the overall structure of the earth and its processes. In volume two, Lyle cites Coy and Gemau's findings on the limitations of coral growth. Quote, they cannot, that is coral, they cannot grow where the water is deeper than 25 or 30 feet. He posits that atolls grow on the rims of volcano craters. Quote, the circular or, excuse me, the circular or oval forms of the numerous coral isles of the Pacific with the lagoons in their center naturally suggests the idea that they are nothing more than the crests of submarine volcanoes, having their rims and bottoms of their craters overgrown by corals." End quote. He further developed this idea, arguing that subterranean volcanoes ha had emerged from the ocean floor and then gradually had been elevated by earthquakes. Lyle's view that the annular rim of an atoll represents a coral veneer of the rim of a submerged volcano was widely accepted at the time of Charles Darwin's voyage on HMS Beagle, uh, which occurred between 1831 and 1836. Darwin. <laughs> Darwin's first major contribution to science were his insights into the development of coral reefs. In the Introduction to the Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs, published in 1842, he explains that his goal is to, quote, describe from my own observations and the works of others, the principal kinds of coral reefs more easily than more, sorry, especially those occurring in the open ocean and to explain their origin, uh, the origin of their peculiar forms, end quote. Darwin identifies and classifies the different types of reefs, and this is the taxonomy uh, that we are still using today. So the different types that he identifies are the lagoon islands or atolls, barrier or encircling reefs, and fringing or shore reefs. Darwin claimed that barrier reefs were formed during the sinking of land mass that had a reef growing on its shore. If the sinking occurred sufficiently slowly, coral would grow quickly enough to maintain the surface of the reef at or near sea level. If the land mass were an island encircled by a reef, and if the island itself eventually sank completely beneath the waves, what remained would be a ring-shaped reef marking the shape of the former island's shoreline. Darwin proposed an evolutionary sequence between different reef structures. Quote, the close similarity in form, dimensions, structure, and relative position between fringing reef and encircling barrier reefs and between these latter and atolls is the necessary result of the transformation during subsidence of the one class into the other. On this view, the three classes of reefs ought to graduate into each other. So he is uh, proposing a sequential uh, development of the atoll. If Darwin's reasoning was correct, and largely he was correct, if Darwin's reasoning was correct and the atoll was the logical endpoint of a sinking volcanic island, then its foundation would necessarily be of volcanic origin. Darwin's theory initiated a heated debate that centered mainly around the question of the foundation from which reefs grew. Perhaps the most significant alternative theory uh, was the one proposed by John Murray, who had taken part in um, the very uh, influential and extensive Challenger expedition of the 1870s. Uh, Murray uh, vehemently disagreed with Darwin's subsidence theory, 
and argued instead that reefs and atolls are built up from submarine volcanoes by the deposition of materials produced from coral growth. Um, so Darwin's greatest uh, coral nemesis uh, did not believe in, in subsidence um, and instead believed that corals were growing on top of the submerged volcano. According to Murray, no subsidence was necessary, but reefs were more likely to appear in areas at rest or rising slowly. So no subsidence occurs, but there is um, movement um, of the ocean floor, according to Murray. By the 1890s, there was an open question as to whose theory was correct, Murray's or Darwin's. All those involved agreed that deep drilling through a living rock would offer incontestable evidence. And this takes us to the Royal Society's expedition to Funafuti. Next slide, please. Funafuti, the largest atoll of the Ellis Group, now Tuvalu, was the site for three expeditions mounted by the Royal Society in 1896, 97, and 98. The primary purpose of these expeditions was to drill at a great depth into the underlying reef and retrieve rock samples for study. The first expedition was headed by, prof by Professor William Solace of Oxford, who was accompanied by Stanley Gardner of Cambridge and Charles Headley of the Australian Museum. Two drillings were attempted um, during this initial expedition using a drilling rig supplied by the New South Wales Department of Mines, but reached only 105 feet um, in one spot and 74 feet in another. Considerable data on the reef, along with extensive collections of natural history specimens were obtained, as well as useful geophysical measurements made by the officers of uh, the vessel HMS Penguin. Solace and his team reached Funafuti um, in May of 1896. A drilling site near the sandy beach of the lagoon was selected and boring began on the 2nd of June. Progress was slow and very frustrating. After 16 days, a depth of only 105 feet had been reached. Solace explains in the Royal Society report that this was due, quote, to the unfavorable nature of the ground and partly by the frequent failure of our machinery. Indeed, several times the drilling hole needed to be lined since porous rock and sand was filling it faster than it could be pumped out. The team decided to select a new drill site, this one much closer to the outer reef, where hopefully things were a little bit more stable. The drill was moved and a second attempt was made on the 3rd of July. It was not easy, remarked Solis, to find a place to which we could transport our machinery. The difficulties of landing on a rocky shore rendered several promising spots inaccessible by sea, while the absence of wheeled vehicles or even wheels and the nature of the ground seemed to put transportation by hand out of the question. When a site was eventually selected, it proved challenging, quote, owing to the influx of seawater at high tides. I should mention that Funafuti um, is at its highest point about three meters above sea level. Another site was chosen, but the results were still wanting. Very little core was obtained and water to continue to flood into the hole and the coral rock through which the bit advanced was highly cavernous. The hole quickly filled up uh, with water and, and sand and coral fragments which threatened to collapse the walls of the hole. A couple of days were spent uh, with the sand pump, okay, so trying to pump the sand out of the hole, but as fast as the sand was got out, it just continued to flow back in. Unable to go beyond 72 feet, that is 22 meters, after 11 days, Solis recorded that they were baffled in our endeavors and with no other part of the island offering more hopeful prospects of success, we had no alternative but to abandon the undertaking. undertaking. That was the first expedition. Not only was the machinery completely inadequate for the task at hand, but the atoll was made up of what Solis writes, 
uh, was material which varied constantly from incoherent to comparatively hard. Part two. Professor Edworth David of Sydney led the 1897 expedition. He achieved the original objective set out by the Royal Society uh, by boring to a depth of greater than, than 600 feet, which was the number chosen by, by Darwin as the number that needed to be reached. Although the bit remained in limestone instead of penetrating the assumed volcanic undermass, the drilling crew under the direction of George Sweet of Melbourne reached a depth of 698 feet before its ac activities were abandoned for the year. David initiated a program for mapping the whole of Funafuti in detail and described the geology of all of the Motu. David arrived on Funafuti on the 19th of June, 1897, and he explains in his report that although the diamond drill that had been supplied to the first expedition was the best that the colony could supply, it was not well adapted to Funafuti's surface. The diamond drill was driven by a portable steam engine and a derrick was erected above the drill to allow easy raising and lowering of the rods. Because they would be drilling below the water line, it would be necessary to bring pumping engines to pump water out of the hole. In addition to the large diamond drill, uh, the second expedition also had a small drill to be mounted on a wooden platform about 10 feet high and to be driven by an oil engine. The purpose of the small drill was intended for drilling on a small patch near the center of the lagoon to get to the bottom of the lagoon. The little drill that had been brought along was not and ever used for its actual purpose of lagoon drilling, since this islet that they imagined was at the center of the lagoon was nothing more than a shoal, according to David, and it would have been impossible to actually erect the drill on top of this um, sort of patch of sand. So the uh, sort of submission of drilling in the middle of the lagoon had to be abandoned. But the 1898 expedition managed to successfully drill to the lagoon floor. So that was something. The remainder of David's efforts went into dredging and chopping the reef rock on the ocean slope of the reef and in making a geological survey of the atoll. David recounts that the main drilling started on the 2nd of July, and by the 5th of September, they had reached a depth of 557 feet, that is 170 meters. By the 21st of September, boring had reached a depth of 698 feet, that is 213 meters. In his official narrative, David reported that a more successful outcome than the first expedition the depth for which Darwin had asked that a coral atoll should be bored, 500 to 600 feet, had been exceeded by reaching 698 feet, and a core had been obtained as good as could be expected considering the fragmental character of much of the rock. This core sample, which still exists, was carefully sampled, packaged up, and sent to the Royal College of Science in London for slicing and for chemical and microscopic examination. Um, in his report, David adds that later examination in the laboratories showed that the base of the coral uh, reef rock had not yet been attained. Since most of the machinery had been left at the bore site, right? they just sort of left their machinery there, it was considered desirable that this main boring hole could be profitably uh, deepened. Consequently, with approval of all the uh, funding bodies concerned, David arranged for his student, Albert Fink, to let the third and final expedition to Funafuti. So Albert Fink of Sydney led the third expedition. He drove the drill bit to 1,114.5 feet before running out of cutting diamonds in October of 1898. Um, again, the bit remained in calcareous reef rock. Fink continued mapping of the atoll and systematically dredged the outer face of the reef. He undertook a further study of the development and growth of reef rock. Fink was accompanied by Gerald Halligan, 
hydrographer of the New South Wales government who arrived on board HMS Dolphin. Halligan's task was to sink a bore into the center of the lagoon from um, the bow of the dolphin to obtain further samples for study to complement those being obtained on shore. With Fink's assistance, he also dredged a series of shallow sediment samples across the full width of the lagoon. Uh, next slide. When the wealth of scientific information collected by these expeditions was published, it served for a time to make Funafuti a center of attention for the world's scientific community. That sounds very grand, but for a short period, <laughs> seems to have been the case. Geologists described the lagoonal sediments, reefs, submarine topography, stratigraphy, deep structure, and petrologic composition. In addition, reports appeared of the collections of the flora and fauna of the atoll. Funafuti became the best documented atoll in the Pacific and Indian Oceans by the turn of the century, and it would only be displaced by Bikini and Owatak um, uh, because of uh, American, Amer uh, American atomic testing. In addition to the official report published in 1904, the Royal Society published a portfolio entitled Atoll Funafuti Maps, consisting of 19 colored plates, 14 of which are geological maps. Um, yeah, next one, I guess. Each islet is also represented through several cross sections. In all, there are 91 geological cross sections. Details on the geological maps were based on pacing, uh, that is measuring linear distance through walking. These maps provided the first and most detailed mapping of any atoll and clearly showed the different arrangements um, of the zones of the atoll's superficial features, surface features, both on the islands and over the reef flat. 20 geological units were identified, and you'll see them on the right-hand side. Uh, that is the index that goes with the maps, including, for example, the Brescia sheet, that is layers of coral deposits, mud, and sand, and the hurricane bank, that is the rampart of coral rubble that accumulates during tropical cyclones, or what was then called a hurricane. Not only was the nature of the materials described uh, included, but also the relative age of the samples and whether it had been formed chiefly on the ocean side or the lagoon side of the atoll. So um, these, uh, these are my own personal pictures of, uh, of the maps. Um, you'll have to pardon the, the quality and the lighting at times. Um, but on the left-hand side, you can see the overall map a geological map of Funafuti um, with the different areas with this, sorry, each box there, sheet one, sheet two, all the way to sheet 14, represents what is also included in the portfolio that is a detailed map of, uh, a detailed map of that section. And on the right hand side is the detailed index um, that you are meant to be looking at when you look at individual um, section maps. Uh, next slide. As mentioned, the overarching purpose of the expedition was to test Darwin's theory of atoll formation. And as such, Punafuti seemed as good a choice as any amongst the British Pacific possessions. Um, I would like to focus on the two or three islet descriptions and their accompanying maps. Um, these are the islets of Telelele, Motu Sanapa, and Motu Loa. Uh, and this is plate five, sheet three, um, that includes that, uh, that area. In the section in the report that describes the islet of Telelele, David remarks that, quote, to understand the history and destiny of the islands on this atoll, the, quote, southern reefs and islands appear to me to supply the index or key to most of the islets on the atoll 
especially since they exhibit some of the more intense phases of erosion and the manner in which it operates in nearly all its stages. So according to David, uh, a comprehensive study of the southern reefs of Funafuti would allow one to extrapolate and apply the findings to the entirety of the atoll. Um, I just want to show you, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, in the next slides, there you go, sort of, uh, sort of more closer, more detailed um, photos of the maps. In the context of Funafuti, David claims to have found the, quote, key to understanding the atoll's evolution in the processes of what he identifies as denudation, solution, corrosion, and violent erosion. These phenomena are identified as the major agents of geological change on the atoll. Quote, Regarding these three islands as a whole, we have seen in them a Brescia defense all along the ocean side, but broken in places. There a breach is forming or has formed through which the southeast gales sweep over a portion of the island to the lagoon, carrying away the fragmental material of which it is largely composed, undermining the trees, creating channels or enlarging any already made and eroding deep into the Brescia sheet on its east and severe corrosion is taking place, removing the Brescia sheet and corroding deeply into the floor of the reef itself. As these processes continue, and you can go to the next one. As these processes continue, writes David, sand will continue to accumulate until it eventually, quote, forms the nucleus of a small island farther out on the lagoon platform when these older present islands have been all removed. Okay. <clears throat> what begins to emerge from the geological report, although its writers never make it explicit, is the precarious nature of atolls and its smaller islet units. The geological report makes clear that when understood in the broader context of time and space, the existence of atolls is highly temporal and dynamic. Strangely absent from David and Sweet's geological report and accompanying maps is an account of the role of water in the formation or deformation of the atoll and its islets. Existing at the very edge of the warm tropical Pacific Ocean, Funafuti is a fluid system relating dynamically to ocean hydrodynamics and coral biology and evolving in response to change in sea level, ocean currents, or storm events. Although water is absent from the maps, none of the cross sections go into the lagoon or ocean waters, the different materials that make up the islets are barely terrestrial. For instance, occurring on both the lagoon and ocean side is an upper portion of living, of living algae, that is lithothamnion, that is, quote, a wash at low water of spring tides, and when it surrounds the edges of channels and blowholes, it is bathed by the spray. Also present on the ocean and lagoon sides is a zone of dead coral, Heliopora chirulia, compacted by sand. In between the coral's branches, quote, water finds easy subterranean passage right through the reef from the ocean to the lagoon. And as the tide rises, seawater wells up through an immense number of small holes in the highly porous lagoon platform. Thus, lithothamnion, a type of algae, and Heliopora chirulea, blue coral, along with other porous and semi-terrestrial materials make up the quote, land of the atoll. A land which as David and Sweet make clear is interspersed and permeated by water. The case of the Funafuti expedition foregrounds the terrestrial logic that dominated the conception of insularity in the 19th century. Progress in drilling was frustratingly slow Although the tone of the official report is generally confident, there are clear moments of uncertainty and failure. For instance, when new drill sites have to be selected because of the unfavorable nature of the ground, 
And more often than not, holes have to be lined and relined since porous rock and, and sand fill it, as Solis puts it, faster than it can be pumped out. Changing tides were, uh, were also a challenge since a borehole would easily be flooded, quote, owing to the influx of seawater at high tide. If we return to the lead geologist of the 96 expedition, William Solis, um, we can read his reminiscences about the failures of his drilling expedition. He writes, a very free communication must have existed between the borehole and the sea, for whenever a big roller broke upon the reef, the rods lifted, and after the lining had been withdrawn, water spurted out of the borehole with the fall of every wave. The open nature of the reef is further indicated by the fact that the seawater rises with every tide to fill certain depressions, which occur in many places in the middle of the island. As the tide ebbs, this water flows away down fissures, often so rapidly as to form little whirlpools. Drilling on Funafuti involved treating an ocean environment as land in order to extract deep core samples. However, against the monolith of colonial science that the Royal Society represented, we can begin to reconceive of the concept of island. And I would like to contend that the atoll's ecology pushes us to the limit of the European concept of island. In fact, I cannot think of a more astonishing instantiation of oceanic insularity a fluid resistance to land through the open nature of the reef. Reading the scientific report from Funafuti evokes the historical and cultural trope of the island as a laboratory. In the scientific realm, myriad ecological, evolutionary, and anthropological theories were developed based on the assumption that islands are closed systems. But I wonder what happens to the discourse of the island as laboratory when the island is not a self-contained self -contained system, when it quite literally leaks. In Discourses of the Island, Gillian Beer explains that the quote, characteristic of the island concept conserved in island biogeography is that of difference from surrounding environment. But what if there is no difference with the surrounding environment of the water? What do we mean by the term atoll? The term can refer to several possible components, the coral island itself, the living reef that grows out from the island, and where the reef separates from the island, the lagoon at the bottom of which more coral might be seen. Moreover, if we look at David and Sweet's um, plates, we clearly see that Funafuti is made up of smaller islets separated by water. Go back just a couple, just to the first map page. That one, yeah. All right, if we, we see that Funafuti is made up of at least um, 30 smaller islets separated by water or connected by a submarine coral platform. None of these islets and their components are ever bounded by the sea. And thus, we cannot accurately speak of an, an atoll's terrestrial cohesion. Unless, of course, we dispense with the competing narrative of the atoll as terra firma, and rather recognize it as terra aquaria. Thank you. Thank you.